Hi, everyone. Great uh, to be here. Uh, I'm very excited uh, to uh, uh, you run and I decided to put it together. And I'm, I'm really excited about this talk because purpose for me is such an important concept. And uh, when we uh, prepared for this, I got more and more excited about how much I can get out of this uh, conversation about purpose. So, Yaron, I want to start uh, just... Uh, you, Tom, before... Yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to say, I just want to say hello to everybody. Um, hello to Tal and to everybody else. I also want to uh, say that I miss you guys. I mean, how much better would this be if there were, what are we, 238 people live in an audience right now sitting in front of me? That would be so much cooler, so much better. So... We're making the most of this, but it just ain't the same with you guys not here in the flesh. Right. And uh, as you know, we announced uh, next year's Ocon is going to be in Washington, D.C. And if you can't wait, there are going to be a couple of opportunities. It's going to be uh, Atlanta is going to be in October. Sorry, November 6th to 8th. We're going to have a student conference uh, in Atlanta. And then if you want to join us in the gala, it's going to be October 1st in New York. Hopefully everything will be open by then. Um, so let's kick it off, Yaron. You know, when we started talking about purpose, it, it reminded me of a story when I was a young, very young CEO. Uh, my first week as a CEO, I was overwhelmed and I started working like crazy 14 hour days. And uh, in the end of the first week, the CEO, uh, sorry, the owner of the company uh, invited me to his room and said, what are you what are you doing every day 14 hours i see the lights on at 10 p.m what's going on i said like i'm working i'm working as hard as i can i'm a ceo now and he said what are you trying to achieve and i said that's a really good question and then he gave me a, a an analogy that i'll never forget he said you know we're all dancing in the dance floor but from time to time you have to go up to the balcony and look at what's going on and look far and know what you're you know and and for me that stuck uh, as, as always have a vision, a purpose to what you're doing. So let's kick it off by what is for you, what is the meaning of purpose? What is it? So purpose is the why. You know, why am I doing this? Uh, you know, why am I giving this talk right now? I, I could be at the beach. No, wait, we're in lockdowns. So I couldn't be at the beach, but I could be doing you know, a dozen, two dozen, a million other things. Why am I doing this? What is the goal? Do I have a goal? Am I trying to achieve something? If so, it, is it a legitimate goal? How does it relate to all my other goals? So it really is this, the pursuit of a goal intentionally. Purpose is about, you know, being intentional it's about knowing what you're doing, knowing why you are doing it. And it, it's a recognition of the fact that I can actually choose. <laughs> I can be here or I can be at the beach. I, I can be somewhere else. I, you know, I can choose how to set my life. I can choose what values to pursue. I can choose how to live. I am actually in control. And that means I've got a whole selection of values. I'm not set to go in one path. I can change paths. I can pursue lots of different things. So, you know, purpose is really that goal directedness. It's the idea that you are goal directed in every aspect of your life, in every aspect of your existence. It's that is open to choice where, where, you, where, where, you, can, where you can choose. It's about being a valuer. It's about pursuing values in an intentional way, in a thoughtful way, in a purposeful way. Okay, um, I'm being told that something's wrong with the video. Is everything good? Uh, Video's not great, so you're, you're kind of jagged. It, it looks like low quality bandwidth on your end. Okay, well, we'll try. Anyway, so I wanted to continue. It seems like, before we dive into it in more kind of detail, but it seems like there's a need, a human need so is it psychological? What is it about the need of having a purpose? Because sometimes, you know, when you lose purpose, it seems like everything's going down, right? So what is that need that, that, that humans have to have purpose? Where is that coming from? 
Well, at the most foundational level, at the most basic level, it's the fact that we don't know instinctually, automatically how to live, that, that we have to choose our values. And because of that, if you, if you think about the fact that we have so many values, there's so many things you could be doing, there's so many things you could be choosing, um, you have to consciously decide what's important and what's not. What's going to lead you towards your goals and what is not? What goals are worthy of having? From the most abstract to the most concrete, there's no automatic mechanism to make that happen. You have to actively pursue it. You have to actively engage. You have to actually actively think. And, it, to, to, but the, and this is all the way at the level of survival, right? At, at the very basic of just as a human being to survive. We have no automatic knowledge of how to survive. So you have to, in every, in every activity in life, from, from the basic activity of, of, of getting food, <laughs> and uh, you have to pursue certain goals. You have to pursue a certain path, and you have to figure out what those goals are and figure out what that path has to be, needs to be. And... That is at the very core of why we need purpose, because we don't, we don't know how to live. We have to figure it out. We have to make the right kind of choices. We have to use our reason and, 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 and allow our reason to, 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 solve the, you know, to help us solve the problems of survival. And then as you go up from survival, as you go up to living life as a human being, with all the spiritual and material needs that human beings actually have, well, it gets more and more complex. It gets more and more challenging. But all of that is part of living. And all of that requires us to, have, to be very goal-oriented, to be very focused, to be very rational, to be very systematic about the values that we choose. And if we're not, then we flounder. If we're not, then we choose values that are anti-life or we, or we waste a lot of time or we go in directions that are unproductive and unconstructive to a, to a happy life or to a productive life. And, you know, and, and I, the, the bad thing that happens as a consequence is, is unhappiness and lack of focus and, and depression and, and drift, not knowing, not knowing what's going on, what, you know, why. So why is it, Yaron, why is it so hard? Why, why do we see so so many people confused, unhappy in the world around us. Why, why is that so hard to achieve? Why, why aren't we, why is it like, an, it's not like a nature to us to, to always pursue something? Why by, I don't know if it's by default, you know, uh, we're not pursuing rational values. Well, but that's the point. There's no default, right? It's so hard because it's not automatic. It's so hard because it requires choices. It requires action. It requires thinking and reason. And it's so hard because at the end, it is dependent on our fundamental choices in life. It is dependent on a fundamental philosophy, a fundamental morality. Uh, that is going to guide the purpose or lack of purpose in our life. And if the purpose in our life is anti-life, then you get this constant clash between the values that you're pursuing and the needs for self-preservation, the needs for living a life as a human being. Mm -hmm. And that clash manifests itself in anxiety, in stress, in unhappiness, and in, 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 in a difficulty in life, in midlife crises, in, in, all, in all of these kind of phenomena where, where, where self-preservation requires a certain path because reality is what it is and human nature is what it is. And, and, and you are pursuing a completely other path because you're guided by, let's say, altruism, a philosophy that tells you self-preservation doesn't matter, what really matters, or, or, or living doesn't matter, or taking care of your own needs or your own happiness doesn't matter. What really matters is other people. What really matters is sacrifice. What really matters is denying yourself for the sake of others. What really matters is sacrifice. Then... Even if you choose a purpose, let's say, in your career and you're successful in it, at some point, that's going to clash against this other idea of, but wait a minute, what am I doing? I should be sacrificing. I should be taking care of others. And, and that conflict 
it's psychological. That conflict is in every dimension of your life, and it causes people to rethink their life, to question everything. But then they still lack, okay, but what do I do now? Unless they're willing to question their morality, unless they're willing to question their most fundamental, the purpose of morality, the goal of morality, then they are stuck with purposes that clash with their actually human nature, with actual requirements of happiness, with actual requirements of success qua human being. And that would, creates, would that say, creates all these disasters. Yep. Would you, you say that a midlife them. crisis? Yeah. Would you say that a midlife crisis as we know it is related to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a sense in which we're, when you're young, you're focused on a few things, right? And, and, you know, one of them being career. You know, if you're a better person, if you're a good person, you're focused on career, you maybe want a, want a romantic relationship and you're, and you're driven and, you, and you, you, you're full of energy and you're, you're just experiencing life and you're coming out of the gate and everything looks possible. And you haven't really thought about ethics. Morality is in the background, but it, for most of us, it's altruism in the background. But you're just focused right now because you, you want to you want to you want to be successful. You want to do good. And and many people who have been life crisis are very successful people. Are people who have, uh, you know, from their twenties on, you know, single mindedly focused on this on this career. And then they've got a family, and they've got two kids, and they've got a dog, and they've got a they've got a house, and they've got a you know, in the old days, a station wagon or whatever. And and you know, everything looks like it's clicking right. And then and then at some point, I think. The, 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 the altruism and, and comes into the forefront and, and it says, well, what are you doing? Uh, on the one hand, isn't the good something else? Isn't the good that you've been taught your entire life something else and you haven't been doing that? But also, you know, why have I devoted myself long term to a family and a wife? Uh, what's the, where am I going with this? What, what's, what purpose is this? Why, why, why can't I just go with any young, you know, uh, 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 beautiful woman. Uh, why can't I drive a sport? You know, why can't I do these other things? Why, if, if I'm not going to be moral, because they usually put that aside, right? They put, I'm not really going to be Mother Teresa. Nobody wants that. Then, well, why this? Why Korea? What's the point in Korea, right? Uh, why, why follow that? Why, why uh, family? Why any of these things? And there's no, there's no answer because they've divorced, their fundamental abstract moral concepts, which they've never really articulated, never made really made real from the day to day life. And that conflict manifests itself in, um, you know, in this midlife crisis. And then, you know, and, and you look at, and it's not just midlife crisis. Look, young people, young people experiencing this as well. There's a, there's a well-documented phenomena and you can see it in, with with people like Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson and, and religion and Rick Warren, who wrote a book about uh, you know purpose in life, uh, the the evangelical preacher, young people who who don't know what to make of their life, they don't know what to do with their life, they don't know why they should do anything, they they don't know what the what the purpose is, and and they're drifting and and they're going nowhere and they're in the mother's basement and they you know they're attracted to crazy ideas or they're just playing video games because. They don't know what life is about. And, and then you listen, and, 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 and then what happens is people, these self-help people and, and people who may be a little bit more intellectual than just self, self-help people like Sam Harris or Jordan or religion, they come about and say, yeah, there was a, you need a purpose, guys. Let me help you find a purpose. But almost all of them, Sam Harris is a bit of an exception here, but certainly Jordan Peterson and certainly religion and so on, they say, yeah, life, and, and this is Jordan, right? This is what he says. He says, life is miserable. Life is pain. Life is suffering. And the only way you can deal with it is to find a purpose. And the real purpose, if you really want a meaningful purpose, a pe- purpose that will really animate your life, it has to be outside of you. It has to be focused on others. It has to be on other people. It's, he talks about taking responsibility. First, he says you have to take responsibility for your own life. You know, make your bed, stand up straight, do stuff like that. Take responsibility for your own life. But then to really achieve, he never talks about happiness because he doesn't think that can be achieved. That just happens. Then you need something external to you. So again, even the self-help gurus, at the end, in the guise of self-help, helping you, they sell altruism. 
at the end, it's not about how to achieve your values, your life, your happiness. It's about, in, in Jordan Peterson's case, reducing pain. It's about eliminating struggle. And, but, but the only way to do that is by adopting some, in some form, adopting altruism or some kind of altruism. So, so let's go for the positive. Let's, let's, you know, let's talk to an 18-year-old, a 20-year-old. They're ambitious. How would you guide them towards, you know, well, what, what would you answer if they ask you, okay, Iran, what is the purpose of life? What am I trying to achieve here? And then maybe the next question is, how should I go about figuring my purpose? Because I don't know yet. I just graduated. I don't know what I'm interested in. Where should I go? How should I start building my purpose? Yeah, so, so first, the purpose is the purpose of your life. There's no purpose to life other than life. The question is, what is the purpose of my life? And what is the purpose of human life, if you will, as individuals? And the purpose is to live, to live well, to live, as Ayn Rand described, um, a, a life as a human being, as, as a life that is fitting for a rational being. Um, so you can't, and this is what, this is the problem with, with, with most of the self-help guys. So some of them want to divorce purpose from morality. Mm -hmm. And some of them want to sell purpose in the frame of altruism. Neither one of those can be successful. I mean, you can give somebody purpose that's altruistic, but there'll be a clash and it'll destroy them. And you can try to divorce purpose from morality, but again, that'll clash and that'll destroy them. The beauty of objectivism, the beauty of Ayn Rand's ideas is that purpose is a cardinal value in morality. It is an, an essential part of what it means to be moral. It is an essential part of what it means to live. It means to pursue your life. And, and what is the moral purpose of your life? Well, it's happiness. It's to achieve happiness. It's to achieve that state of non-contradictory joy. And, and to counter the Jordan Petersons of the world, it's not this momentary pleasure. It's not just having a party. It's not having fun. It's, it's, it's something much deeper, much more sustainable over, over time. It's a state of being that is a positive state of being, of belonging in this world, of embracing and loving the love, the life that you have. So that is your purpose in life. It's to, it's to live that kind of life, the kind of life suitable for a rational being. And, and to do that, well, you need to do, I think, two things. I mean, you need to do a lot more than that, but, but two things to start off with. First, you have to embrace morality. You have to embrace certain abstract values. You have to understand them, integrate them, and really, really you know, understand how they are geared towards making your life uh, purposeful, making your life uh, uh, valuable and ultimately leading to happiness. Uh, so you start with the most abstract values and then you have to have more concrete values that lead you to those greater abstractions and ways in which to achieve them. You know, and a lot of those values are going to be personal values. So you have to figure out what your personal values are but but is it uh, let me ask you this so it seems like there's a relationship between value and purpose and and isn't like a, a spiral would you say that it, me is beginning my life trying to figure out what my values are and being more purposeful around it is it like a spiral that grows and grows over time would you describe it like that well absolutely as as you achieve your values as you learn more about life, as you understand moral principles better, as your knowledge, both abstract and at the concrete level, expands, you know more, you're better integrated, your choice of values becomes more, uh, you know, more mature, but, but, but more informed and more meaningful. Uh, it, it, so, so it's a constant spiral. You're constantly learning. You're constantly improving. It's not like, you know, again, other than the abstract uh, values, the, the universal values. It's not like, you, you, you know, you, you fix values when you're 18 and those are the values for the rest of your life. I mean, thank God that's not true. I mean, the things I liked when I was 18, I, you know, I, I, I 
completely reject uh, it, or, or some of them are reject today, right? So you 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 want to you want to be able to to grow and to learn and to integrate your knowledge into your values, and that's that's what purpose allows you to do. It it purpose is this focus on doing that. It's a, it's it's about focusing on your values. It's about focusing on your choices. It's about focusing on your goals. And it's about prioritizing them, choosing between them, creating hierarchies of them. And it's not fixed. Every day requires you to re-engage that purpose because every day there are new value, potential values. There are values you might want to drop. There are things that uh, there's new information, new knowledge, new ideas that you've encountered that will you know, make your life richer. So purpose is the standing command, if you will. You know, focus on the values in my life. And it's a huge abstraction because it covers self-esteem. It covers, every, it's, it, you know, it's one of the three cardinal values in objectivism, reason, purpose, self-esteem. It covers every human activity because every human activity, every individual activity is about values. It's about pursuit of of. of of the things that are important to you that, that you want to act again or keep. And it's, so it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a task. And as the value, it's, it's that I am going to be focused on this. This is important to me. This is what I'm going to spend real energy and real thought and real effort to do. I'm going to figure out what's really important. And it's, it's more than just what's really important because you have to be careful here of subjectivity. You know, a lot of times people say, oh, well, think about what's really important to you and what, what you love and then go pursue what you love. That's your values. But one of the important steps there is to make sure what you love is good. And what does good mean? Again, what is the purpose of it? <laughs> it? Make sure that what you love is life enhancing. It is truly life enhancing. And it is life enhancing relative to the other values you could, you could follow that, or you could pursue that, um, you know, that might be more life enhancing that might, uh, you know, so it's a constant, you're constantly choosing and you're constantly creating hierarchies and you're constantly uh, uh, evaluating. And that's what it means to have a life of purpose. It's not, you do it once and it's over. I mean, maybe what you do once is define the abstractions, but even then I learn something about the objectivist ethics every day every day or every time I, I listen to one of our philosophers or, or, or every time I pick up one of Ayn Rand's books or one of Ayn Rand's essays and read, I learn something new. So even there, you're constantly evolving, you're constantly learning, you're constantly growing, and that's going to affect your hierarchy of values. That's going to affect the purposes that you have in your life. Let's talk about uh, the concept of central purpose, the idea that you have you know, of course, on the productive side, one central purpose that really guides your life, the direction of your life. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between purpose and central purpose? Yes. So there are a lot of values in life. Um, and, and there are a lot of even, you just think of the different categories of values, right? There is there's love, there's friendship, um, there's family, which relates to love, but, but in some ways, in some ways doesn't it, there's, uh, entertainment, uh, did I mention career? There's, uh, you know, there's, there your are a lot health. of different categories, yeah. your values. Health. What's that? Health. Your yeah, health. there's health. It's a lot of different categories and each one of those, the work that purpose requires you to engage in the purpose, the purpose kind of, uh, is to create hierarchies in each one of those and figure out, but that's a lot. And you need some integrating, something to integrate them around. Uh, you know, the one thing in life that's limited is time. And the older you get, the more you realize how limited it is. It's every second is gone. Every second you don't live again. And if you're an egoist, Oh my God, you need to make every second count. Well, count towards what? How do I integrate it all? Now you can say happiness, but happiness is, is, is not, it's, it's hard to concretize what that means, right? So you need something to help integrate, to help make you choices. So when you make a choice between two values, purpose is what 
determines which one of these values you're going to choose. Well, what is my purpose? What is my goal? What am I heading towards? But there's so many values and there's so many different hierarchies. You need something that integrates them all so that you can use the time that you have as effectively as possible to live the best life that you can to live a life appropriate for a human being. And the, the, the purpose that is the, the purpose. So you need a central purpose. You need something that allows integration of everything else to it, that every other activity you do integrates to it. And for human beings, again, if you go back to the original, if you, if, because survival is not automatic and knowledge is not automatic or anything like that, the central purpose, so, so just getting food or anything is not automatic. We have to work for it. The central purpose of our life is productivity. It's to be productive. It's productiveness. It's career. It's work, right? It's taking care of ourselves in the material realm. And to do that, we have to engage everything we know about morality, about the principles of morality. I mean, and, and that's one of the reasons it is the central purpose, it is the integrating purpose. It is where we spend, where we engage our mind the most. It's, it's where we challenge ourselves. It's where we engage with problems in reality the most. It's where we achieve the most and gain our self-esteem. So it's, it's, it's the integrating activity that we engage in is our career. And then everything else has to be measured accordingly, right? So family, you know, one of the confusing things that people suffer in our culture is people say everywhere, they say family is the most important thing. I mean, you ask anybody, anybody, they'll say family is the most important thing. And then if you want them to feel an instant element of guilt, because I do this to my audiences and you can see them feel guilty. Well, what activity do you spend most time on, most effort on, most thought on? They always say my work. And immediately they feel guilty because again, they've been taught and it's, it's, it's just a cliche by religion, by that it's family. That's the most important thing, but you can't integrate around that. You can't integrate every activity. It's not, the fact is it's not important enough in terms of engaging your mind, in terms of challenging yourself. And so now maybe for a woman who, or, or a man who's staying home to raise their kids, then that is the career. That is the activity they're engaged in as their productive endeavor. But for the most part, family is not enough to be a central purpose. And again, this confusing messages in our culture that elevates family above all. Career is selfish. Career is just you. Career is about money. Career is about these things. It's about your passion. That creates some of these midlife crisis issues. That creates some of this angst that exists out there. And that angst is reinforced by all the self-help guys who tell people that their family is the most important thing to them, that that's what they... So it's, it's just, again, reinforcing the negatives and why I think this is a big reason why people are so unhappy in the culture, why there's so much misery and unhappiness in the culture. So the central purpose has to be the one activity that really engages everything that it means to be human, engages your reason, it engages your, your productive uh, juices, right? Your, 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 your productiveness. It, it requires you to be the best that you can be at every, any moment. And it's not just any career. It's, and this is true of all values, by the way, it's to be ambitious about a career. That's what a career means. It's to be ambitious about your work. It's to push yourself. It's to elevate. It's to really constantly strive for more because a career is not just work. It's a path. It's progress. So you're right. Now, I, wanna, I wanted to ask you something, you know, I'll, I'll give you a compliment on the way, you know, every time we're together, I feel this sense of energy that you have. And I know that with, with a lot of people that I know are so passionate about what they do, they emit this level of energy that you don't see. They're just passionate about it. They, you know, they, they wouldn't go to sleep just to do more of it. The question that I have that I uh, hear a lot of people is like, how do you find it? How do I know that this is it? Because it's like an evolution. And maybe, so maybe you're from your own experience. How do you know that this is what, I, my, what my central purpose should be? Because there's so many opportunities out there. And life you know, comes at you in many different angles. And there are opportunities that present themselves and so on. What is the, you know, the best tip you can give a younger person on how to really slowly figure out 
uh, what it is that, you know, that will make them exert so much energy? So first I'd say that I'm probably not the right person to ask because it took me about 20 years to figure it out or 22 years to make <laughs> that, right? So, I, I, you know, very few people that I know are like Howard Rourke. Howard Rourke knew he wanted to be an architect from when he was a little kid. And, and that was it. And it, it was never in question. And he just knew it. He, 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 he loved the, the act of creating the building. You know, Ayn Rand describes it in the fountainhead. And it's, it's that he, he introspected and that was obvious. It was just there. Most of us, it's not. For me, it certainly was. It's like her, I, by the way, right? What's that? Howard Rourke is like an Ayn Rand. It's like an Ayn Rand yeah. herself. Ayn Rand knew right? when she was nine or ten she, or eight, I can't remember, that she wanted to be a writer, that she wanted, that was her purpose. And she knew exactly what it was, and it was a central purpose, and, and, it, 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 and, and it was for, for most of her life. I think philosophy became a central purpose once she finished Atlas Shrugged. But so, so for me, it didn't. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was 18. It, you know, in, in Israel, you go off to the army, so you don't even think about it in, in some sense. And then coming out of the army, I had no idea. So what did I do? I, I introspected. I started by saying, what do I like doing? And I made a list of, you know, a list of, of the things that I, that I kind of like and the kind of activities I think I would enjoy. Um, and, uh, you know, the kind of activities that I think I would enjoy that I could also make a living at the kind of activities that I would enjoy that I would study, that, that I would go, because it was obvious to go to school. And I have to say that I wasn't completely first-handed back then. So um, it, it took me a while to get rid of the kind of the, the second-handedness that I think I, I was raised with. So there certainly was an element when I was, when I was very young of, well, what, what would be acceptable to my family, right? So I look back and I say, I love history. Why didn't I go study history? Because it wasn't even one of the, you know, it wasn't in the scope of the possible. I was going to be a doctor or an engineer or a scientist. That was it. There was, no, there was nothing else I, since I was young. Not because I necessarily knew that that's what I wanted, but that, that's because how my life had been framed. So I, I, I made a list and, and I, I knew I didn't want to be the kind of engineer that sits behind the desk all day, but I figured it was engineering. I wanted to build something. I wanted to create something. So I knew I, I didn't want to be the kind of engineer that sits behind a desk all day. And I was really terrified of having, of having a nine to five job where you go to a desk job and you just sit there. And so I looked at all the different engineering jobs. So one, you introspect and then you look out into the world. Okay, how do, where's, the, where's the match? Where's the fit? I looked at all the engineering and I, I looked at all of them. And um, by the way, I was supposed to be a doctor, right? My, my, this was what I wanted to be when I was very little, what my father wanted me to be. He's a doctor. And what, until the day I, the, the day I went to the first classes in engineering, my dad still said, I can get you into medical school. And, you know, but I knew I didn't want that. So I, I took all the engineering and I said, okay, desk job, desk job, desk job, that, that job. And of course, I missed the opportunity of a lifetime to be a computer engineer at the best time in history to go into that and become super wealthy. But the one that looked like it involved the least amount of sitting behind a desk and building and creating stuff was civil engineering. So I went and studied civil engineering and I embraced it and I enjoyed it. And that's the other thing you're going to hopefully you, and part of this is developing and I don't know how to do it, developing a mentality. I enjoy a lot of things. I, I, I could, I enjoy a lot of different topics. My biggest challenge is always to limit the scope because I enjoy doing so many different things and engaging in so many different things. But so then engineering. So I was an engineer for a while. And then I said, well, what do I like about engineering? Well, I liked the management. So I went and I, I went to start, get an MBA and I got an MBA. And then I said, well, do I really like the management. I really like this finance stuff. This finance stuff is fun. So I got a PhD in finance and then I taught a class and I said, hey, I kind of like this teaching stuff, you know, so I always gravitated to what's, what, what that am I doing now do I love the most? And I, became, I was a finance professor all the while, by the way, studying objectivism. That was kind of a theme throughout was this, I was always serious about the philosophy. So, and I was engaged with it. So by the time I got to a position where I, I, I had the job at the Institute at ARI, which I, you know, was my purpose. And, and my purpose was that, you know, my purpose in a sense is teaching but it's teaching something very specific, which is not engineering and it's not finance, it's living. Um, and even then, right, I'm not somebody who does one thing. I've never done one thing. It's, so my central purpose is a little tricky. 
um, because I have, I've, I've often had two careers, but it's about teaching, it's about engaging the world with this philosophy, engaging minds with this philosophy, and that became my purpose. But it took me a long time, and it took uh, a, a route to get there, and once, once I got to that point in my life, it was obvious. So it wasn't something I could have ever predicted when I was 18 or 22 or 30. Maybe into my early 30s, I could have predicted this, but not when I was young. So the point is, find things that you love to do that intersect with something that, with a real job that's available out there and go and do it. And, and, but always look around and look, for, look at other things. Do I enjoy something else even more? And always be open and always be curious and always you know, look at a broad set of values. Don't shrink yourself. Don't limit yourself. Don't, uh, you know, so, and, and I think even if their first attempt at finding a central purpose is not exactly right, it's not the ultimate central purpose you want in your life. It'll serve as a central purpose for that period in your life. And, and it was, when I was an engineer, I was an engineer. I, I, I loved it and I engaged with it and every, that was my central purpose and the same with any other step in my life. Well, that helped. Great. You know, I, um, I think we're very much so. And I actually, everything you say is just, it's exactly, you know, with, with me. I've done several things in my life. I enjoyed it. If you asked me at the point in time when I was doing it, is that your percentage? I would say, yes, that's what I want to do. And then you find something better and you look back, it's like, wow, this is so much better than before. Yep. Um, yeah, so I think we're on to something here, Yaron. I want to read something. I'm going to talk about this book, if you know, recognize this, of course, uh, a, a little bit about tomorrow. But I want to read something. Uh, when we were preparing for this, this is from the chapter on virtue from Opar. Uh, I think the last sentence says it all. He says, uh, he's, he, so Leonard talks about a, a, you know, a man of purpose. He says, he's the person with a passionate ambition for values who wants every moment and step of his life to count in their service. Such a person does not resent the effort which purpose imposes. He enjoys the fact that the object his desires are not given to him but must be achieved. In his eyes, purpose is not drudgery or duty, but something good. The process of pursuing values is itself a value. Which Absolutely. Which very and, powerful. And, you know, it's, it's very powerful and it's, it's, it's true. And, and, you know, to live a purposeful life, I think you have to take every one of these different realms uh, of life, family, love, uh, art, I forgot art before, entertainment, career, every one of them. And you need to give them all. Um, you need to really think about them and you really, really engage with them and take the time to really prioritize and create hierarchies for each one of them. And yes, they all need to be integrated around a central purpose, but central purpose doesn't mean all consuming purpose. It doesn't mean no time for anything else, but Think about what you like about having friends, what friends you like and what you don't, which kind of friends you want to pursue, which you don't. Your romantic relationship, your art, it, the art that you love, it, surround yourself. I've often said this on my show. Take the things that you are in control of in your life. You're not in control of politics, by the way. Take the things that you're in control of in your life. Uh, the art you consume, the friends that you have, your romantic relationships, the recreation, the vacation, the entertainment. And, and I'm not listing these as if they're all equal because they're not. They're, they're different places in your hierarchy. So you need to make them such and then create hierarchies in each one of them and pursue them with passion as if your life depended on it because your life does depend on it, right? And know what you like and why you like it. And if you don't know what you like, and, and a lot of us don't know what you like. I, you know, when I started pursuing art, I didn't know what I liked. And... But don't limit yourself too to what you like today. That's the other thing. Stay dynamic in, in, in work, in friends, in, in art, you know, in, in, in everything that you do. Constantly be open to improving, to building. To, you know, we talked about this last year when we talked about art. You know, don't settle for the music you grew up with. Push the boundaries. Test new stuff. Go and explore. And if there are things that are classic that your friends recommend and so on, take it seriously. And you might not like them in there. They might not be values for you. But at least try because, again, life is short. 
it's you don't get a single second of it back and and it's got to be enjoyed uh, because that's the that's the experience of the happiness is is that joy so you've got to enjoy it not in a superficial way but in a deep sense so constantly be ambitious about your values don't settle seek out the best you know in your context given your abilities given your interests you know and live them you know your values and your purposes are you they are what define you you are your values you create uh, your soul i mean ayn rand has these great passages about and, and uh, Anka has an essay about this. You are the creator of your own soul. And the way you create your own soul is by the purposes you choose and by the values you pursue and, and that you gain and, and you keep. So be ambitious, be passionate, and, and go out there and, and, and do it. And, and look, you know, I thought you were going to ask me earlier, how do I, why have I got so much energy and, and passion? Um, it's because I love what I do and it's because I care about it and because it's completely integrated into everything that I am. It's me. It's, it's not a face I have to put on in order to, to do it. It's, it's not like I drink some energy potion or, or switch some energy switch in my mind. This is just who I am. And if you engage me with something that interests me that I love, the passion is just there. The energy is just there. It, it, I don't know where it comes from, but it, it comes from that purpose. It comes from those values. It comes from being ambitious and caring. And really at the end of the day, it comes from loving life, loving this life. So just to concretize your, like your last recommendation, last Ocon, I don't know if you remember, but you recommended me to start listening to classical music and Rachmaninoff yes. in, in specific. So since I bought a stereo system with two huge speakers, and I did exactly what you told me last talk, just to lie down in the dark, high volume, and oh boy, it's a whole new world. And as a musician, it, you keep on learning about, wow, this is possible. And this is, so uh, yeah, Great. go educate yourself in, in so many different ways because you don't know what's possible and what other values you can pursue. And uh, it goes back to the idea of a spiral. It's an ongoing spiral and you get better and better. Um, so I want to leave some time for q and A. I, yep. We're running out of time, so uh, I don't know, Keith, if you want to take come back and tell us uh, if there are any yeah. more any questions out there that we can answer. Yeah. So okay, good. So we've got just about ten minutes left for questions. Um, we're using the Zoom Q and A module. So if you look at your Zoom controls, uh, you might need to click on more, but you'll see a thing that says Q and A, and you can post questions there. We already have a few. Posted. So I'm going to start with those, give priority to people who've posted questions already. One thing we're going to do throughout the conference, I think uh, for this session, we just have a little bit of time. So I don't know if we'll do it right now, but we're going to want to, we're going to prioritize questions from people who are willing to ask their questions live. And we're going to use the hand raising feature. So you can use, if you go into the chat, I think you can use, there's a hand raising button. And if you want to turn on your camera, turn on your microphone and ask the question live, we can do that. Um, as I said, probably we'll do it at the ne next time around. Um, so let me just, let me jump in with taking some of the questions that we already have in the Q&A module. So Andrew asked the question, what is the connection between purpose and pride? Can you say something about that, Yaron? Sure. So it, it relates to the point I was making at the end here. Pride is moral ambitiousness. Pride is the, 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 the seeking moral perfection. It is, it is the action necessary to achieve your purpose. You're not going to achieve happiness unless you strive towards moral perfection, unless you're ambitious in morality, unless you pursue the virtues. The virtues, all seven of them, including pride, um, lead you to reason, purpose, and self-esteem. Uh, they are the means by which one attains those values. Pride is the one that says you have to take all of them seriously and you have to be ambitious about all of them and you, you, no compromise. So it's, it's a necessary means to attaining purpose as a value. Okay, Abtin is asking, are the concepts of human life and purpose essentially the same thing? Um, you talked about values, you being, being um, you, your, your values are your purpose. Uh, what about human life? Is it, without purpose, is it even possible to live life as a human being? Um, 
No, you know, you can, well, I mean, not as a human being, not a fully human life. Um, now you suddenly can, you know, people, you can see people, and we didn't talk about this, you can see people who are purposed less. You know, midlife crisis is a mild version of this, but you can see people from very young who are unfocused, drift, have no ambition, don't do anything with their time and their life and, and really a waste. And in that sense, they're completely not living in any single dimension. A lot of people are mixed. They might be, for example, very serious about their career and have some purpose in parts of their life, but are drift in other parts of their life. And they're just unhappy, right? And, they, and, they, and they're not living to their fullest potential and they're not living the fullest life that they can live. But to really abandon purpose in every aspect of your life Life is impossible unless somebody feeds you, right? Because, because you, you can't even feed yourself. You need some purpose at some level to even do the basic requirements of life. So, no, a, a purposeful, no purpose is, 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 is no life at the end of the day and certainly not a human life. Okay. Um, you know, I we probably can take some using the hand raising, but I'm going to ask one more question from the Q&A module and then we can go do the hand raising. I think some of the hand raises put their questions here as well. So Yeah. So Debbie, well, Debbie is asking, what advice do you have when you, uh, when you face setbacks in life, bad luck, like a car accident or an illness, or when you've taken a wrong turn? Um, how do you get yourself back on track? And that's actually related to a question from Mark you know, what do you do if you no longer like what your purpose has been so far? So what about if you've taken a wrong turn or a wrong choice somewhere along the way? Well, let's take the bad luck, an accident or something. You know, first, you can't let it go too deep, right? So you have to put it in the perspective of your entire life. Uh, hopefully, you still have enough of your capabilities to be able to still engage with life, engage in positive aspects of life. There are some values that are still open to you. It requires a, a new introspection about what values are open to me, what values are now achievable, given you might have had an accident and now you can't, there's some things you can't do. I, I, you know, I've had back problems for a long time. I can't play soccer. I love playing soccer. I can't do it. That can be a value. And of course, for some people who've had much more serious injuries, you know, it, the, the scope of what you cannot do might be larger. But what you need to do in those circumstances is that is instead of regret, right? Regret is useless. You cannot go back in time. It goes back to, you know, time is one directional and, and there's no second chances. There's no going back in time. So all you can do is, okay, this is where I am. This is the context. These are my values. What can I do? What is open to me? And I'm going to be ambitious about that. I'm going to pursue that with a passion. I'm going to, even if it's a much narrower set of values, that's what I'm going to go after. Um, and for Mark's question, I'd say, again, you should always be questioning and challenging. And if you discover that your purpose has changed, then change, you know, change the purpose. If, if you're not enjoying your job, if you're not enjoying your career, if you're not, if, if you're not happy with your wife or your family or whatever it happens to be, then first make sure that, again, it's objective. Again, the danger here is, is subjectivism or whim worship. You've got to make sure it's objective. You've got to make sure it's tied to life and tied to your pursuit of life and tied to your larger scale purposes. And, and then you've got to make changes in life. Uh, and life is not static. Changes are necessary. You, you, you know, again, career, I've, I've had five careers, only one wife though. And, and that's, a, you know, and, and, and I, I think I'll only have one wife. So it's, it, but you gotta, you gotta be able to reevaluate constantly uh, every one of these things and then shift. And, and it takes courage. It takes courage to walk away from something that you've dedicated a lot of time and effort and thought to, but now is not good for you anymore. Yaron, I, I want to add one more, layer, one more layer to it. You know, when, when there's a setback or there, you, make, you make mistakes, sometimes people get caught up with their negative emotions. You know, it's just they can't see beyond that. You say, okay, get over it, go. But what would you say about the fact that you're some, sometimes just stuck in regrets, stuck in, you know, I made a horrible mistake. I have anxiety of changing my well-paid job to something else. What is, your, what is your answer to dealing with emotions that in a way 
get you caught up in all this? I'm not a psychologist. So all I can say, and, and I'm not trying to be flippant here, is, is you got to get over it. You got to refocus yourself on your purpose in life. That is to live and to live life as a human being and to make the most of your life. You've got to find a way to psychologically reorient yourself to your ultimate purpose, which is life. Life mm -hmm. as a human being. Okay. <clears throat> and, and sometimes that's hard. And that's, that's why psychologists are so important. And that's why psychology is an important field to, because there are, there are methodologies on how to do that and how to overcome overwhelming emotions. You cannot, I don't want this to be sound rationalistically where, yeah, just say to yourself as a mantra every day. No, I mean, this is something you have to, you, you have to integrate and, and psychologists, it's a positive profession. It's not about fixing you. It's about helping you orient your life in, in, a, in, a, in, in the best direction possible when sometimes you're stuck. And understand the role of emotions and what they are and how to deal with them. Yep. Right? Okay, let's try having somebody uh, come online. So Rivka, I just allowed you to speak so you can, un I'm going to unmute, oh, I just muted you. There we go. So you can unmute, you can turn <laughs> your camera on and would you like to ask your question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. I uh, don't know how to turn on my camera, but um, I think there's a thing that I could do. That's okay. Why don't we go uh, ahead? It just, it just says microphone. Well, anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, um, I think I think some um, the public school system in our country really fosters dependence, and um, and it's strange that at such a young age, when students are eighteen they're expected to go off in the world and know what they're supposed to do when all along they've been told what they what to do and what they should choose and being told this is good this is not um could would you have um perhaps advice or a way of thinking for let's say uh, an adolescent who's in who's in that position of they're, you know, in school because I have to be my parents will go to jail if they, I don't go to school <laughs> um and um, so how can, they ma how can an adolescent maximize his um, potential, his, um, his independence, his, um, his um, ability to make conscious decisions within these constraints? I mean, I think that it's, it's a matter of, again, if the adolescent, how aware the, the adolescent is um, of himself and of, of ideas and of the world around him. Um, it's a really, it's a, it's really hard when they're that young and your ideas are not formed yet. And your moral code in a sense is not formed yet. And you're learning. I would say that at that age, the most important thing for a young person to do is learn, 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 learn. And, I, and I'm not just saying learn in the, in the bookish sense, although that's also important. But learn by experiencing. Go out into the world and, and try things and, and experiment within boundaries. And, you know, it, and again, it, the tricky part is you've got parents and you're still, you're still in, a, in a legal situation. But experience things. And parents should encourage adolescents to experience things, experience new things, try new things, not fit themselves into a box in terms of what they are supposed to do, what people expect them to do, what they need to do, what their parents want them to do. But, but really open their minds and, and, and open them to, to what it is. Now, again, some adolescents know exactly what they want to do, like, like a hard work. There are people like that, but not everybody does. And, and you want them to give, you want them to have the space as a parent and you want them as children, as, as adolescents to feel confident enough to go out there and test and experiment and try new things within the boundaries of life enhancing values. Um, and, I'd also say this, I think one of the, I, I never understood this about the US, about American parents. It seems like since from the age of like two, kids are, tra are, are, are trained to go to college and which college and the, you know, they have to get the grades to go to Harvard and, and there's this obsession with going to college at 18 and, and going to white college and knowing exactly what you wanna do and, and, and uh, you know, doing everything is oriented towards this nuttiness. And then in high school, your entire high school is oriented towards college. It's like, 
let me enjoy high school. I, you know, I haven't even, I don't know what I want to do. You know, college is later. It's, it's this crazy long-term planning at a time of life when the kids can't do long-term planning because they don't know enough about the present. They don't know enough about the past. and They don't know enough about themselves. So it strikes me that um, I think a lot of kids in the world today need a year off. They shouldn't go to college maybe two years off. They should go travel around the world. They should get a job. They should do something. They should meet new people. They should leave their neighborhood. They, you know, they really need some real world experience before, because they're so sheltered and they're so protected and so oriented towards this goal, which was never their goal. Nobody, they didn't choose to go to college. It's the parents have chosen. They didn't choose to go to Harvard versus their local community college or whatever. Their parents chose it for them. So to break away from that. I mean, I struggled with that in terms of, as I described earlier, I struggled with being limited by my parents and what are the options I had at the time. And I think it's much worse today with kids. And uh, yeah, I would, I would suggest delaying college and, and taking some time. If you don't, if you're not sure what you want to do, if you're, if you're one of these, then, and, and go on, go and work or, or, or go travel or, 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 you know, find something else. Don't play video games, but go travel or work. Uh, I think both of those are good activities for a young person to do before they go to college.